A rainy and cold afternoon to everyone. The 24th of July marks the 139th anniversary of the inauguration of the Manila Water System, also known as the Carriedo Waterworks. The establishment of the first water system in Manila has provided clean water to treat the 100,000 residents of Manila and its suburbs during the early 18th century up to the late uh, late 18th century to early 19th century. This webinar with sign language interpreter is brought to you by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines Museo El Deposito in partnership with the National Council on Disability Affairs in celebration of the 43rd National Disability Prevention and Rehabilitation Week. To give us the welcome remarks and his message, let's hear it from the NCDA Executive Director, Engineer Elmer Rojas. Good afternoon to our visiting guests and our esteemed participants. Today's orientation on AJ Recorder number 417. Executive Order Number 417 mandates the implementation of the Economic Independent Program of Persons with Disabilities. EO 417 and the Executive Policy signed by the then President Claudia Acapalgal Arroyo to address the issue of economic independence of persons with disabilities. Employment is one of the major drugs of the government, but despite the efforts in promoting various employment-related programs and services, employment for persons with disabilities is always a challenge as qualification standards pose as a barrier to many, thus PWDs have no other records but to seek welfare support in order to continue living. But the welfare is considered a bottomless pit since there is no end to the financial needs of people to augment and provide solutions to the economic needs of persons with disabilities, livelihood and entrepreneurship programs provide a viable alternative to employment. EO 417 provides opportunities for persons with disabilities to engage in business with the full support of the government anchored on the basic principles of entrepreneurship EO 417 provides technical, financial, and most importantly, marketing support to entrepreneurs and to put icing, icing on the cake. It mandates the government agencies to provide 10% allocation of their procurement needs to PWD products and services if available in their coverage area that you avoid aggregation of the benefits in cooperation with the National anti poverty Commission and with the support from the British Embassy and pilot tested the implementation of EO 417 several years ago in collaboration with various government agencies that has tested the SWD and several selected barangays, new voice organizations have been part on the PWD empowerment program. We were able to develop and create life build programs right in their own communities, benefiting dozens of PWD families since its conceptualization 
in 2012 that we have a duty empowerment program from that a well plan program can really support the economic empowerment of persons with disabilities. I ensure everyone is so excited already with this promising program. Let us support the implementation of EO 1417. Let us all work together to empower persons with disabilities through entrepreneurship anchor on EO 417. Mabuhay ang Pilipino may kapansanan. Mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you so much, Director Rojas. Now, let's proceed to introducing our speaker this afternoon. Our research speaker took up her doctorate in contemporary history at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, Spain from 2017 to January 2021. Her dissertation entitled Public Works and the Spanish Colonial Agenda of Sanitation, Order, and Social Control in the Late 18th Century to 19th Century Manila is related to the topic that she will be presenting this afternoon. From the same university in Spain, she finished her master's in contemporary history on September 2015 to October 2016 as sobresaliente cum laude or outstanding. Currently, she is an assistant professor at the Department of History, University of the Philippines. Without further ado, let us all welcome Dr. Ross A. Costello. Hi, ma. Maraming salamat po sa inyong introduction, Ms. Kay. Um, uh, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat, maulang hapon uh, sa inyong lahat uh, na nakikinig at sa iba pang bahagi, hindi lamang sa Maynila, kung hindi sa iba't ibang bahagi ng, ng ating uh, bansa. Um, Mag-shift. Mag-share screen lamang po ako para. Ayan, nakikita na. Okay. Um, katulad ng binanggit ni uh, Miss Kay ng ating tagapagdalay ngayong hapon ay uh, itong paksang ito ay napakalapit sa aking uh, sa akin no as a researcher because um, one chapter of my dissertation is actually devoted to the Manila Works um, Manila Water Works project um, that was conceived in the 18th century and materialized in the 19th century so ngayong hapon mapalad ako na mabigyan ng pagkakataon na maibahagi yung uh, isang uh, eh, May bahagi po sa inyo, yung isang bahagi ng aking pananaliksik. You know, yung ang, El, ang Museo El Deposito is very close to my heart. Um, habang nagsusulat ako ng aking dissertation, um, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and um, contacted me if I could uh, do the research and help them with the research and writing of the museo. So, hindi ko pa nabibisita pero hopefully ay mabisita ko sa sa hinaharap, no? So, um yung mga materials na ginamit ko, yung sources na ginamit ko para sa aking presentation ngayong hap ngayong hapon at makikita rin ninyo sa museo kapag uh, mabisita po ninyo. Um karamihan dito ay archival materials, no? Mga um sources na nakalap natin from the different archives not only here in Spain but also in the Philippines at yung iba't ibang mga religious archives din dito sa Spain. So um, medyo naging challenging kung paano i-reconstruct itong uh, paksang ito but uh, thankfully uh, with the extant sources na meron ay nagkaroon tayo ng isang uh, narrative no ang paano nga ba nagsimula yung pipe water supply in Manila okay so 
tulad ng binigit sa atin uh, kanina, to the, um, this week, kinakommemorate or sinaselebrate, inaalala natin ang um, inauguration ng uh, Manila Waterworks Project 139 years ago. On the 20th to the 24th of July, 1882, Manila and its residents were portrayed in a festive and jovial mood. The streets and the facades of houses and public buildings were decorated with banners. The entire city was lighted and decorated with arcs and other artistic adornments. Carpets and awnings were erected along the principal streets of Manila, such as Escolta. A big banner with the words, Acarriedo, El Arabal de Santa Cruz, or Tucarriedo from the Santa Cruz suburb, and poles marked with Enaro Palacios, Barra, and Hove, were displayed at the Visita Bridge or Puente de Visita, which connected Binondo to Santa Cruz. The centric Plaza de Goite was also adorned with arts and works of art, which depicted allegories to the inauguration of the waterworks system. In Quiapo, where a street and bridge no, were named after Carriedo, exaltation for the philanthropist came in a decoration in the decoration of uh, doors, houses, doors, banners, and arcs. The Carriedo Bridge had flower coronations, while the long street stretch from San Sebastian to San Palo was adorned with masts and colored lanterns. There were also sports activities in the different parts of Manila and its suburbs during this week, no? during this period from 20 to 24 July. At night, the streets were illuminated until 10 o'clock in the evening. The plazas were filled with night performances of almost all important civic and military bands. Fireworks in Bagumbayan became the most awaited part of the night. The 23rd day of July in 1882 was the highlight of the week. Ngayon ay tayo ay 20. Four. So kahapon, kahapon, no, 139 years ago, kahapon, yun yung highlight of the week. Why? Because this was the formal inauguration of the first waterworks system of Manila, a day that was chosen to also celebrate the birthday of the Queen Regent Maria Cristina. A civic procession was held which was participated by the different sectors of the city, from the high civil and religious officials, members of the Manila City Council, members of the foreign consulates in the islands, members of the Sociedad Económica de Amigos del País, the press, different professors and students of uh, different schools and universities, urban and urban residents of all classes. Artistic floats depicting the different symbols of water paraded the streets. An order was released, no? stating that all babies, lahat ng baby na ipapanganak on the 23rd ay mabibigyan na pagkakauluban ng 25 pesos. No? True enough, almost all of the babies registered in the capital on that day were named Cristina or Cristino in honor of the Queen Regent and the inauguration of the Manila Water Works. Kahit yung mga magpapakasal, yung mga couples na magpapakasal, binigyan din sila ng cash prize. All these activities form part of a week-long celebration of the inauguration of the symbolic foundation, I'm sorry, of the symbolic fountain of the potable water system at Manila, named after the project's principal benefactor, Francisco Carriedo y Perida. These celebrations and the festive reception of the people became a symbolism of a new age in the capital. In the words of Manila's colonial officials, the act or the inauguration of the symbolic fountain became a symbol no? to the opening of the capital of the archipelago to a new era of prosperity and fortune. In the Philippines, the Manila Waterworks Project was one of the most significant colonial sanitary infrastructure projects in terms of magnitude, budget, and period of completion. 
primarily considered as one of the most important sanitary infrastructure achievements of the Spanish colonial government. The Manila uh, Waterworks Project was a centerpiece public works project of the City Council of Manila at the helm of the techno-scientific expertise of the engineers of the Inspección General de Obras Públicas. No. This project, the hydraulic system project, was intended to provide solutions to the problems of health and sanitation in a rapidly urbanizing Manila, a capital that was perennially plagued by cholera epidemics throughout the 19th century, and a city that was in dire need of adequate, clean, and safe water. So that was, it, it, ito yung ano, ito yung mga kaganapan sa Manila noong July 20 to 24. So ang Manila talagang nagsiselebrate, no? celebrating because para bagang it was a new age no for the capital. Isang napakalaking public works project ang napasinayaan at for uh, the longest time no, na inaabang-abangan yung uh, pagbubukas ng uh, Manila Waterworks ay napasinayaan ito noong July 23, 1882. Now, today, ang magiging paksa, ang magiging uh, discussion ko talaga ay paano nga ba nagsimula? Ano yung origins? Paano nagsimula? At paano nag-develop yung proyekto ng uh, paglalagay no, ng um, sistemang patubigan o ng waterworks project or waterworks system sa Manila. My presentation today is divided into two parts. First, titignan natin yung contribution, yung legacy ni Francisco Carriedo y Perida. I think yung term na Carriedo, yung, yung uh, pangalan na Carriedo, ay uh, very familiar sa atin. No? Pero later this afternoon, titignan natin sino nga ba siya at bakit mayroong kalye, mayroong area in Manila na ipinangalan sa kanya. Even the Manila Waterworks Project no, ay ipinangalan sa kanya. Ang tawag ay El Canal de Carriedo. No? Or the, ito yung pangalan na, na binigay doon sa Manila Waterworks System. No? And the first, uh, in, uh, and the initial attempts, no, uh, and plans ng uh, Manila Waterworks in the 18th century. And then, ikalawa, ipapakita ko sa inyo towards the late 19th, 18th century and the first half of the 19th century, makikita natin yung changing urban environment of Manila. Ano yung mga kinaharap na mga suliranin at mga pagsubok ng Manila bilang isang syudad? At paano ito nagbigay daan sa renewed attempts no para nga magkaroon na ng isang sistemang patub ng patubigan ang Maynila. And then third, ipapakilala ko sa inyo kasi ang madalas ang kilala lang natin ay si Carriedo. Pero this time, bibig i-highlight din natin isa sa major player no. Um in very important figure kung bakit na uh, na concretize ang Manila Waterworks project si Enaro Palacios. At yung naging kwento no, ng uh, kung papaano, plinano, in-execute ang piped water system in Manila in the late 19th century. And lastly, ipapakita ko sa inyo noong na, um, na construct na at na ilagay na yung uh, waterworks, ano ang naging kondisyon o estado ng water access and, distrib and distribution in Manila in the 19th century. Okay. So first, si Francisco Carriedo y Perida, no? and the first and the first waterworks plan for Manila in the 18th century. Si Francisco Carriedo y Perida ay isang Spanish colonial official na nagsilbi na nilbihan sa Manila noong 18th century noong 1700s. He was he worked for the Galeon de Manila at sa kanyang um, engagement no sa Galeon de Manila nagkaroon siya ng fortune, nagkaroon siya ng yaman no. Dahil sa kanyang nalikom na yaman ay 
um, ang ginawa ni um, ni Cariedo ay nag-donate siya ng 10,000 escudos sa Ayuntamiento de Manila. Ito yung tinatawag na Cariedo Funds. Dinonate niya ito sa Ayuntamiento de Manila upang magsilbing pang, um, initial capital o initial funds para magkaroon na nga ng uh, sistema ng patubigan o ng waterworks system ang Manila in the 18th century. Now, um, ano yung plano nito? No? Of course, yung uh, plans noong 18th century ay ibang-iba sa plano ng 19th century because it was very much limited to the state of technology at that time. Ang idea was from, ang isa kasi sa excellent source ng water along the Pasig River in the 18th century ay yung tubig na makikita sa present-day Makati area. Nandiyan, kasi nasa upstream area siya ng Pasig. No? Mm, hindi, ito yung area ng Pasig River na hindi, um, hindi na masyadong nahaluan ng tubig alat no? mula sa Manila Bay. So yung area na yan ng San, Ped, ng San Pedro de Makati area o yung area na ng Makati sa kasalukuyan sa Guadalupe, yan yung isa sa mga areas ng excel, area uh, ng excellent source ng, ng water in the Pasig River. So ang plano ni Cariedo was yung water from Pasig River in Guadalupe ay i-conduct, padadaluyin siya sa mga pipes made of clay tiles or bricks hanggang sa makarating sa iba't ibang mga kabahayan sa Manila no especially sa area ng Intramuros now as i've mentioned a while ago um very much limited yung ganitong klase ng technology kasi yung clay tiles at yung brick no na mga pipes ay hindi ganoon ka superior yung quality also given the fact na ang Pilipinas, ang Manila ay madalas nililindol. So ang naging usapa, naging usapan ng mga panohong 'yon ay paano ko pag lumindol, no? Magbe-break itong mga clay tiles na ito at masisira lamang din. So isa 'yan sa naging challenge noong Cariedo Waterworks project kahit na mayroong pera na 10,000 skudos na capital, ay may technological limitation yung plano. Also, pagdating ng 1760s, itong, sorry, itong funds pala na ito, itong donation na ito ni Cariedo, ay ipinagkaloob niya sa Ayuntamiento de Manila noong 1733. No? Now, 30 years after, in the 1760s, so, medyo mabagal ang takbo no, ng, ng plano. 30 years after, in the 1760s, ma, matatabunan itong proyektong ito dahil sa British occupation sa Manila, magkakaroon ng uh, problemang pinansyal, yung funds ay makukulangan, hanggang sa naisagilid itong proyektong ito sa panahon ni Cariedo. Okay? But that fund, itong fund na ito, na ipinagkaloob ni Cariedo, yung 10,000 escudos, ay mananatili sa kaha or sa treasury ng Ayuntamiento de Manila. And one century or hundred years after the donation of Cariedo, mariresusitate ang Manila Waterworks Project at gagamitin ang Cariedo funds at yung interes na nakuha nito mula sa bangko upang magsilbing pangunahing kapital para makapagpatayo ng sistema ng patubigan sa Manila. I will just want to share with you, ito pala yung uh, relief no, ng, ni Francisco Cariedo. Isang, well, lumitaw din siya sa isang coin. May mga commemorative coins na ipinagkaloob uh, na ginawa in his honor nung na-inaugurate yung uh, Manila Waterworks Project in 1882. Now, alam natin na si Cariedo ang isa sa principal benefactor or um, uh, ng proyektong ito dahil sa ilang mara, mara, dahil sa mga maraming dokumento na nagpapakita ng kanyang donation. This document, for instance, is an example 
of uh, para siyang uh, the record, para siyang record ng buhay ni Francisco Carriedo y Perida, kinikwento dito yung kanyang uh, service na binigay sa colonial government, sa Spanish colonial government, yung kanyang donations na binigay. Makikita itong dokumentong ito sa Archivo General de India sa Seville, sa Spain. So the title of the document is Traslado Authentico de los Papeles de Méritos y Servicios Hechos a su majestad, donativo o suplementos a Real Caja por el general Don Francisco Carriedo y Perida. So this is a copy, no? an authenticated copy, no? noong, yun nga, noong papers ng merits and services given by Don Francisco Carriedo y Perida to His Majesty, including also yung kanyang donations and other um, donations given to the Real Caja or to the Royal Treasury. Okay, so yan yung, ito yung dokumento. Okay? Now, so 1730s, 1730s to 1740s, hanggang sa namamatay, hanggang sa namatay si uh, Carriedo, may sasagilid, no? Kasi pagdating ng 1760s, the British occupation of Manila, and then 70s, 1780s, naging iba yung priority ng city government. Now, Pagdating ng late 18th century, pagdating ng 1780s, 1790s, 1800s, 1810, 1820, magbabago ang complexion ng Manila. No, ito yung tinatawag ko, ito yung nakalagay dito sa inyong screen, the changing urban environment of Manila. Ano yung naging characteristic ng Manila in the late 18th century? to the 19th century. It signaled, this period signaled the ballooning of Manila's population. Lalaki, sobrang lalaki ang, um, ang uh, populasyon ng Manila mula around 70,000 residents to 300,000 residents by the end of the 19th century. So ganun, no? May mga pag-aaral dito, halimbawa si Norman Owen or si... Uh, Peter Senos, no, pinapakita yung, yung demographic development ng Manila at nakita natin yung trend talaga from the late 18th century to the 19th century, sobrang dadami ang mga residente ng Manila. Bakit? Ano yung reasons sa, pag, uh, sa balooning na ito ng populasyon ng Manila? Because nagkaroon ng socio-economic transformations nung panahong ito. Ito yung panahon na, um, of course, yung basic Philippine history class natin, no? ito yung panahon na uh, mas magiging intensive yung participation ng Manila sa international trade. Ito yung panahon na magkakaroon ng inward migration papunta sa Maynila, lalong-lalo na sa mga pabrika na ipapatayo sa Maynila, yung pabrika de tabako, magkakaroon dito ng mga libo-libong mga, uh, mga manggagawa. Okay? At yung period din na ito, yung late 18th to 19th century, ay period ng intense intensive or in, intense urbanization in the Philippines, in Manila, I'm sorry. Anong ibig sabihin nito? Magkakaroon ng maraming mga kabahayan, magkakaroon ng maraming mga structures, both uh, government structures, to, uh, civil, private, uh, privately owned uh, structures in Manila. So talagang kakapal, no? Kakapal yung uh, mga tao at yung structures, no? yung built environment ng Manila. Now, alam natin no, yung, ano yung natural trend ng population explosion at ng urbanization, magdudulot ito ng problems of sanitation and public hygiene. So by the late 18th century, magsisimula na yung pag, paglitaw ng maraming colonial reports no? tungkol sa worsening conditions, no? worsening sanitary conditions of Manila. No? Isa sa mga laging bababanggit, especially pagdating na ng 19th century, ay yung worsening uh, condition ng water sources ng Manila. In the early years, in the early centuries, 
ang talagang principal water source hanggang 19th century before the inauguration of the Manila Water Works, ang principal source of water ng Manila residents ay ang Pasig River. Ang Pasig River, the esteros, no? surrounding the capital, and the different streams, yung mga streams and creeks no na makikita sa iba't ibang uh, surrounding areas of Manila. Ito yung mga magiging, ito yung principal sources of water. Pero dahil sa paglaki ng populasyon at urbanisasyon sa Manila, mapapansin yung uh, contamination no, at degradation ng mga water sources na ito. Dadagdagan pa ito ng waves, no? yung iba't ibang waves ng cholera epidemic from the late 18th century to the 19th century. Now, crucial o magkadugtong na magkadugtong, magkaugnay yung cholera epidemics sa problema ng tubig, di ba? Kasi ang cholera ay isang waterborne illness. So kapag may pumuputok na cholera epidemic, lagit-lagi lumilitaw yung urgency at na magkaroon ng maayos na uh, water supply ang Manila. Lagi yan. No? At mayroong madaming pag-aaral dyan. Halimbawa si Greg Bankoff, uh, nag-aaral tungkol sa no, tungkol dyan, nag-aaral si Xavier Uwex de Lemps tungkol dyan, tungkol sa iba't ibang mga epidemia ng cholera na tumama sa Maynila. At kung paano nito na kumbaga na-emphasize na may problema sa water supply ang colonial capital ng Manila. Now, this is the map of Manila noong 1816. Ang gusto kong ma-appreciate natin dito ay ito yung sinasabi ko na kung mapapansin ninyo, kung i- kung i- compare natin yung mga maps of Manila in the earlier centuries, pagdating ng 19th century, mas magiging litaw. No? Mag- mag- magkikita na natin na ang dami ng mga structures sa paligid. No, this is the Pasig River. Structures on the left bank of the Pasig River. Structures on the right bank of the river. Kikita natin yung intramuros. Makikita, sorry. Makikita natin yung dumadaming mga... Um, residential areas and settlements here in Ermita, in Malate, in Paco. And of course, syempre, yung mas burgeoning, no? yung mas active na side ng Manila, yung mga communities on the right bank of the river, itong area ng Tondo, of course, Binondo, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz, San Miguel, Quiapo, and Sampalo. No? So ito yung mga, ang tawag natin dito ay the Manila Arabals, the Arabales of Manila, the suburbs of Manila. No? Itong right area na ito, ulitin ko, Tondo, Benondo, Santa Cruz, San Miguel, Quiapo, Sampalo. No? And then on the left bank of the river, of course, the political and religious center of the capital, Intramuros, and Ermita, Malate, and Paco. Now, kasabay ng population explosion na ito at ng intensive urbanization ng Manila noong 19th century ay yung pagdating din at pag-iral ng iba't ibang mga kaisipan, mga revolutionary ideas kung tutuusin patungkol sa urban planning, patungkol sa concepts of public health and hygiene, concepts of sanitation, and concepts of um, of social control. No? Isa siguro sa mahalagang makita natin context at this time was yung in the late 18th century, merong isang kaisipan na sobrang lakas, 18th until the 19th century. No? Ito yung tinatawag na miasmatic theory of disease. Siguro yung ilan sa atin ay pamilyar na dito. Ito yung paniwala na ang cause ng disease o ng mga ng mga uh, sakit ay ang mga miasma. Kaya miasmatic no, miasma. Yung miasma ito yung um, um, vapors. Ang paniwala ay mayroong mga vapors o um, yung hangin no na na, na i-emit no ay nag, nagdudulot ng um, nagdudulot ng sakit 
kung ito ay contaminated. Kaya ang paniwala noong 18th century to the 19th century kailangan ay subpuin itong mga sources ng miasma. Ang sources ng miasma ay madalas yung mga spaces na agglomerated, yung mga dikit-dikit, no? halimbawa mga dikit-dikit na kabahayan, o di kaya ang sementeryo ay isang uh, um, focus of infection dahil merong meron ditong mga uh, alingasaw no na lum, na naiexcrete yung mga decomposing cadaver, cadavers o di kaya ang mga markets and slaughterhouses yung mga matadero ito ay isang um, center of infection din o di naman kaya ay mga sources of water katulad ng ilog katulad ng ilog basig at ng estero dahil ang paniwala ay merong alingasaw na nanggagaling sa water sources na ito, lalo na kung contaminated ang mga ito. So yan yung theory, yung miasmatic theory of disease. Pagdating ng latter part of the 19th century, because of uh, the developments in epidemiology and technology, makikita at sa bacteriology, makikita na ang, ang sakit ay hindi basta-basta nakukuha sa alingasaw kung hindi no sa mga microorganismo na nagdudulot ng karamdaman but ang mahalaga dito ang ma-understand natin is that in the 18th to the 19th century merong changing ideas in medicine and in public health no nagiging preoccupation ng tao naging preoccupation ng society na malaman ano nga ba yung cause ng sakit no Kasabay nito ay yung pag-spread na tinatawag ng hygienist movement no? o yung hygienismo. Ano yung pagtingin na ito? Itong movement na ito ay naniniwala itong mga tao sa likod ng hygienismo o ng hygienist movement na kailangang i-advance yung public health lalong-lalo na sa mga syudad. No? dahil kailangan upa, dahil ang paniwala ay upang mapataas yung kalidad ng pamumuhay ng mga tao lalong-lalo na sa mga syudad kailangan laging isaalang-alang yung public health yung hygiene yung sanitation no sa pagplaplano ng mga syudad at sa paglalatag ng iba't ibang mga policies patungkol sa uh, pamamalakad ng syudad. Okay? Now, itong hygienist movement na ito, ang gusto kong i-emphasize dito, sa Manila, dumating sa punto noong late 18th century to the 19th century na dumating ang maraming mga uh, colonial officials, lalong-lalo na, no? mga engineers, mga architects, doctors, urban reformers, sanitary reformers, na Dala-dala nila yung kaisipan na ito ng hygienist movement na sila yung nag-push no? na kailangang mayroong gawin tungkol sa public health and sanitation ng Maynila. Okay? And yung isa pa na uh, changing concept ng 18th and 19th century ay yung pagtingin, lalong-lalo na noong 19th century, ay pagtingin na kailangan ang syudad ay buuin ng networked Infra, um, in uh, networked infrastructures o mga magkakaugnay ng mga infrastruktura na tutugon sa iba't ibang mga kinakailangang serbisyo ng tao. Halimbawa, yung network city na ito ay pumapatungkol sa network system of water, network system of roads and streets, network system of public lighting, no? So magkakaugnay at magkaka um magkakaugnay ng mga um, urban infrastructures no? na nagpro-provide ng mga pangunahing pangailangan ng tao. Water, uh, mobility, uh, lighting, etc. Okay? And last but not the least, ito, na, well, napahapiwan ko na ito, but in the late 18th to the 19th century, this also signaled, especially in the Philippines, the arrival of more technoscientific experts more engineers, architects, doctors, and other urban reformers. Kasi ang tanong, 
paano naging posible na nagkaroon ng mga ganitong public works projects or sanitary infrastructure projects? Also because at that time, in Spain, nagkakaroon ng, nagkaroon ng reforms tungkol sa reforms in the sectors of engineering, in science, and in medicine, at nadala ito papunta sa Pilipinas. Well, hindi lang naman sa Spain, kung hindi global trend ito noong 18th and 19th century. No? Yung ay new breed, yung bagong breed no? ng mga techno-scientific and medical experts. Okay. Now, in Manila, pagdating ng early 19th century, especially in the 1840s and in the 1850s, makikita mas makikita yung maraming yung urgency na no magiging mag, magiging urgent na yung paglalagay ng uh, malinis na source ng tubig lalong-lalo na ng inuming tubig tulad ng nabanggit ko kanina sa panahon ng mga epidemya ng cholera lalong-lalo na mas mareresuscitate itong mga attempts na ito halimbawa in the 1840s and in the 1850s, studies and plans by military engineers Tomas Cortes and Felipe de la Corte no, were done and published. No? Mga military engineers sila. What did they do? No, they provided basically yung foundation, no? foundation ng project na dadalhin hanggang second half of the 19th century. They located and mapped the complex network of water systems in Manila and in the nearby areas of the colonial capital. They also um, located the different water sources, no? yung flow ng water sources in Manila, and the demographic composition of the urban capital in the mid-19th century. Halimbawa, itong larawan na nakikita ninyo, itong imahe na nakikita ninyo ngayon, ito yung isa sa mga produkto ng mga techno-scientific studies na ito. Because kailangan mo nang aralin ang topography ng Manila. Nasaan ba yung water sources? Aside from the Pasig River and the Esteros, ano pa yung mga potential water sources nearby the capital? So ito yung time na nag conduct ng maraming field studies, itong mga military engineers na ito, nagpunta sila sa areas ng present-day Diliman, no? sa area ng Quezon City, kasi maraming mga streams dyan, maraming mga arroyos dyan sa area na yan. Nagpunta sila sa area ng um, San Mateo, area ng San Mateo, area ng Marikina, area ng um, San Juan del Monte. So yung mga uh, nakapalibot no, sa Manila, noong 19th century para makita nila ano ba yung mga prince, uh, possible water sources, clean sources of water, no? No, potable water. Um, so halimbawa, kung makikita ninyo, itong, ito yung Manila, no? ito yung Manila, and ito yung, ito yung Pasig River, ito yung Pasig River, now, ito yung Arabales of Ermita, Malat, and Paco, ito yung right Arabales of Binondo, Tondo, etc., so, makikita ninyo dito sa mapa na ito, halimbawa, aside from the Pasig River, ito yung ilang mga water sources na na-identify. No? Halimbawa, kitang-kita mo dito yung pag-highlight sa Marikina River, sa area ng Santola, ng Marikina River. In the 19th century, ang, sa documents, ang Marikina River, ang tawag ay San Mateo River. And then ini-specify, kasi yung San Mateo River na mahaba, tapos ini-specify nila nila which concrete parts of the San Mateo River yung kanilang pinapatungkulan. Halimbawa, the area of Marikina or the area of Santolan, etc. No? Tapos itong areas na ito, no? ano yung iba't ibang mga water sources dyan? Isa sa mga gusto kong i-share no, na um, important contribution ng uh, mga initial attempts na ito, first attempts in the early 19th century, ay yung nagawa ni Tomas Cortes. Because for the first time, no, for the first time, si Tomas Cortes, he did a scientific study kung paano dapat yung water distribution in Manila in terms of yung, demo, yung uh, demograph, demo, demography, no, yung dami ng tao ng Manila, at ano yung kina ano yung kinakailangang volume ng tubig no, na, na uh, produce. So halimbawa, um, 
he they conducted a census, no? So you know, so different suburbs of Manila, halimbawa in Intramuros, in Tindo, Binondo, Santa Cruz, Quiapo, San Palok, San Miguel, San Fernando de Dilao, Ermita, Malate, and the different Chinese and temporary residents of Manila. At ito yung nakita nilang census. No? In Intramuros, there were around 13,000 inhabitants. In Tondo, 37. In Pinondo, 57,000. In Santa Cruz, 19,000. Quiapo, 9,000. Sampaloc, 11,000, etc. Total of around 217, no? close to 220,000 residents in the 1840s. Ito yung, ito yung senso. Ito yung census na nakita nila. Now, For these engineers, napakahalaga sa kanila muna na ma-establish ilan ba yung kailangang servisyohan ng tubig. So, 220,000. Given na kailangan ang isang tao ay nagkoconsume ng 10 liters a day, halimbawa, gaano kalaki ng volume ng tubig ang kailangang i-conduct papunta sa Maynila at ano yung mga streams or rivers or areas ng uh, water sources na pwedeng mapagkunan ng tubig na ito na, ila, da, na ipaparating sa Maynila. And that was, this this data was crucial. no Also, okay, it, yun yung kay Tomas Cortes in the 1840s. Si, kay uh, Felipe de la Corte naman in the 1850s, ang ginawa ni Felipe de la Corte mas advanced na. No? Kasi si Tomas Cortes ang kanyang pinagkaabalahan yung demography ng Maynila, um, yung different water sources in Manila. Whereas si Felipe de la Corte in the 1850s, mas advanced na yung studies niya kasi dito, he already proposed a concrete project no? on how to service, on how to provide water service para sa mga residents ng Manila. So, halimbawa, he already proposed na ito yung kakailanganin halaga, halimbawa for the construction of mines, no? Um, for the acquisition and construction of iron pipes where water will be conducted, for clay pipes, for uh, for fences and other accessories, for tools, for obras, etc. Now, this table will show you yung in the 1850s, according to this military engineer, kakailanganin ng around 200,000 pesos for the necessary works in the conduction of piped water from Tungtung. Ito, yung Tungtung, ito yung uh, nakita ni Felipe de la Corte na isang magandang water source. No, itong tungtong ay nasa bahagi siya ngayon ng um, upper part, upper stream area of the San Mateo River. No? So from tungtong, i-co-conduct yung water through the different uh, through pipes, clay pipes and iron pipes to a water reservoir hanggang sa madidistribute yung water to the different parts of the capital. However, these plans, katulad ng plan ni Carriedo, the plans of... Uh, Tomas Cortes in the 1840s and Felipe de, Cor de la Corte in 1850s were not concretized. They did not materialize due to several factors. Number one, finances, pera, no capital, insufficient yung capital at that time. No, yun talaga yung pangunahing dahilan. Hindi pa sapat. Although in this, during this period, Pinag-uusapan na na mayroong Carriedo funds, pero at that time, in 1840s, 1850s, hindi pa sapat no? yung um, pera na mayroon ang City Council of Manila maging ang central government, ang central colonial government. So from the 1850s, makikita natin ang mangyayari sa Maynila ay magkakaroon ng mga... Um, Alternative ways, alternative forms kung paano ipipurify yung drinking water ng, manang, ng mga residente. As I've mentioned before, ang prime principal source of water ng mga Manila residents ay ang Pasig River, ang Asteros, at ang different streams in, in nearby, the cap, nearby ka, the capital of uh, Manila. Ang mga mas nakakariwasang mga residente ng Manila ay meron silang mga private water cisterns So, kinukolekta nila yung rainfall, tapos meron silang uh, private supply uh, ng water. Pero of course, ang problema dito ay yung um, 
yung quality ng tubig na ito. At this time, ang isang nagkinharap talaga na problema ng, ng Manila ay pataas ng pataas yung presyo ng inuming tubig. Yung mga mas nakakariwasa, bumibila sila ng tubig na binibenta ng mga tinatawag ng mga aguadores or mga water carriers. Tubig na nakukuha sa area ng Guadalupe, sa Makati ngayon, kasi tulad ng binanggit ko kanina, yan yung isa sa mga um, kahit pa paano excellent sources ng water from the Pasig River or di kaya sa mga streams, no? yung San Juan del Monte Stream or sa iba't ibang mga batis no na so uh, pure um excellent pa yung water. So ang ginawa ng colonial government naglabas ito ng maraming mga bandos or mga um mga instructions on how to purify water, no? So halimbawa itong document na ito this is very interesting in the 1850s sa pan- nung pum- sa panahon na pumuputok ang epidemya ng cholera ne Ilang beses um, uh, nare-remind ng colonial government na kailangan i-purify yung tubig. So ang ginawa ng colonial government, nag-publish sila ng bando or ng, ng kautosan in Tagalog and in Espanyol. Ang title ng document nito ay Maliwanag na Aral sa Paglilinis ng Tubig sa Ilog ng Mainom ng Tao. Sige, basahin natin ng konti para lang makita natin. This was published in April of 1850. No? Um, this was written in the 19th century Tagalog, so very different, no? The, uh, the, the document states like this, Ang pagka namasdan o nakita ng superior gobyerno dito sa Sangkapuluan, ang lagay ng pagkabaho ng tubig sa ilog ng Pasig, halos taon-taon dito sa panahon ng tag-araw, at sa pagnanasa ng naturang superior gobyerno ay nagpalagay ng remedyo sa mga tao at lalong-lalo sa karamihan ng mga mahihirap na Tagalog na hindi makakita ng tubig na mabuti kung hindi kumuha sa malayo. Kapag karinig ko ng hatol ng mga marunong na tao dito sa bagay na ito, Ili na lang ko na ipalimbag at sa subdelegado ng medisina. Ah, sorry. Ili na lang ko na ipalimbag at ipamalita ang sunod-sunod na aral na hatol ng puno ng sanidad militar at subdelegado ng medisina at ipinagbilin ang gagawin o aral na sa ibaba nito nang wag magkasakit ang mga tao kung kanilang walang bahalain o ipagpabaya ito itong naturang aral. So ano yung aral ng paglilinis ng tubig sa ilog ng Basi upang mainam, mainom ito? Ihahanda ang isang tapayan o banga at pagbubutasan ang puwit ng maliliit na butas at tatakpan ng isang lienzo. Lienzo ay uh, parang cheesecloth, no? O sinamay. At sa iba ba nitong sinamay ay lalatagan ng buhangin na ang kapal ay apat na na daliring mahigpit, mahigit. At sa iba ba nito ay buhangin ang ilalatag muli at uling. So, mayroong buhangin, no? Lalagyan ng ng buhangin, lalagyan ng uh, uling, no? So, yun yung purification technique, no? At kung magawa na ito ay pupunuin ang tapayan o banga ng tubig sa ilog na parang isang ligihang patutuluin at ang tubig na tutulo ang siyang iinumin. Ito ang aral o turong magaan na dapat gawin o kung ibig namang maglinis ng sa ibang paraang lalong mabuti ay ang dapat gawin ay ang pakuluin na halagang kalahating oras ang tubig at doon sa ginawang salaan na buhangin at uling na parang liga ligiahan ay doon ibubuhos at patutuluin at ipapahangin nang lumabas ang totoong lasa at kasarapan ng tubig. Ang taong ibig maglinis ng maruming tubig ay humahanap ng malalaking sisidlan na para ng mga kalamba. Okay? Yan. So this was published in 1850. So para lang para lang mas maintindihan natin, no? So 
ang ginawa ng colonial government, nagbigay siya ng parang instructions. No? Kasi wala nga, hindi pa nga may lalagay yung uh, pipe to water. So, ang ginawa ay nagbigay ito ng mga rekomendasyon. Kung ang tubig na iinumin ay manggagaling sa ilog pasig, kailangan siyang pakuluan ng halos um, kalahating oras. No? And then, maglalagay ng isang tapayan, isang malaking banga, nalalagyan ng isang cloth, ng isang tela o di kaya sinamay. Ito yung magiging first filtration layer. No? Sa sinamay, dadaan ng tubig, tapos mayroong buhangin, mayroong uling, may buhangin ulit. No? Tapos yung tubig na tutulong mula sa almost three layers of filtration na yan ay pahahanginan hanggang sa ma-reach yung mas natural na lasa ng tubig at ito'y pwede nang mainom. No? Now, itong mga ganitong uh, uh, purification or filtration technique na, uh, na pinigay ng uh, gobyerno as recommended by the different military doctors ay nagbigay naman ng uh, kaunting ginhawa no? sa mga residente. Pero hindi pa rin nito nasusolusyonan. Kung baga ito ay temporary solution lamang. Pero hindi pa rin nito naaalis yung katotohanan na pagdating talaga ng 19th century, especially second half of the 19th century, very poor na yung quality ng ilog pasig at ng mga estero sa Manila. Lalong-lalo na kapag panahon ng epidemya, nagkakaroon, nagiging mga infection hotspots ito. No? Kaya kailangan talagang masolusyonan na kailangang ma-source out na yung tubig sa isang area na hindi ilog pasig o na hindi estero. Kasi in the in fact in the 1870s mismo ang mga uh, members of the City Council of Manila, sila na mismo yung susulat sa Madrid sasabihin nila na hindi na talaga po pwede yung mga temporary solutions sa water crisis or sa water problem ng Manila. Halimbawa, ipapakita ko sa inyo ang isang letter na sinulat ng Inspector Rehedor ng Tondo at ng Sampalo sa gobyerno, sa Central Colonial Government na itinaas hanggang sa Madrid. Itong liham na ito was written in Spanish magpaprovide ako later ng English translation para lang makita ninyo na mismo ang mga, ang mga officials na mismo ng city government ang nagsasabi na hindi na talaga po pwede na walang piped water in Manila, na isang uh, potable water source in Manila. So this is, the, this is the letter. It was written in, the, in 1875, May 1875. So, kalagit na ang summer. Ito yung napansin ko sa mga dokumento. Madalas yung water crisis in Manila, yung water problem in Manila, maraming mga dokumento yung mapro-produce. As in sobrang ang daming pleas, ang daming um, petitions and letters that were produced during um, one pag may pumuputok na epidemya, especially a uh, cholera epidemic number two, sa panahon ng tag-init panahon ng summer, lagi-lagi, ulit-ulit yan, magkakaroon ng maraming reports tungkol sa water problem in Manila. So this is an example, May 10 of 1875. This is the uh, part of the, let the letter of the plea in, in, in Espanol. No? This is the translation that I'll provide. As Regidor Inspector of the Arabal of Tondo and Sampaloc, I present to you, your gentleman, or that the proletarian class, or better said, the people of uh, the, the Arabales are going through hardships with the scarcity of drinking water. The rivers and estuaries that are the main sources of water supply are unbearable due to their state of contamination. Perhaps it is because of some plants floating in the country known as liya. Hanggang ngayon, di ba, nakikita pa rin natin yun sa Ilog Pasig, no? yung floating na mga plants. Itong plants na ito, 
ay nagsist, nagiging cause ng um, ng uh, worsening ng water condition ng Pasig because um, according to them, no, uh, the plants um, has ay nagmix, no, nahahalo sa tubig and has corrupted the the state of the water na even ang mga uh, ang mga um, fish o ang mga um, kung sila uh, ang mga isda no ay hindi na makita sa sa ilog naturally uh, mahig- uh, sabi ng uh, official na ito marami daw na- nakikita ng mga decomposing na isda sa ilog Pasig due to the worsening state of the water ito na yung babala If you do not come in time to correct this state or if you do not provide anything better to change this, I am afraid that the local community out of necessity would have to always use this water for drinking as there is none other and we would be sorry for an eventual cal- eventful calamity, God forbid. For this reason, I fulfill uh, in fulfillment of my duty as inspector of the Arabales, I inform you in order to create the measures suitable to save the population from a forthcoming misfortune as a consequence of the insalubrity of this primary need. So, talagang, ano, um, sumusulat na talaga sila. Hindi na talaga pwede kasi yung ilog pasig madumi, marami ng mga floating plants and dead fish, Uh, hindi na kaaya-aya yung lasa at yung quality. Kaya minsan, or di ba, meron tayo yung mga romanticized images of the Pasig River na noon, um, malinis. Well, kung ikukumpara siguro siya ngayon at yung uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, walang walang komparasyon. No? As in, sobrang grabe na yung state ng Pasig River ngayon kung ikukumpara ng late 19th century. But in the mid 19th century to the uh, second half of the 19th century serious problem na yung worsening uh, quality no ng Pasig River at hindi hindi na ito yung laging depiction na pristine yung yung Ilog Pasig no Okay now dahil sa Dumaraming apela, dumaraming pleas and petitions na magkaroon na nga ng uh, piped waterworks in Manila. Um, dahil na rin sa nakikita talaga no, uh, ng isa siyang matinding pangangailangan. At dahil rin sa pagdating sa Maynila ng mga bagong breed no, ng mga inhinyero at mga arkitekto at mga urban reformers, Pagdating ng second half of the 19th century, binuhay muli yung proyektong ito na maglagay na nga ng pipe water system in Manila. Led by an engineer, si Henaro Palacios. Si Henaro Palacios, kaiba siya sa mga unang dalawang inhinyero na nabanggit ko. Because hindi na lamang siya, hindi siya military engineer. He was a civil engineer. Kaya ina-argue ko na isa sa mga pamunahing dahilan kung bakit na-concretize itong public works project na ito because of this man. We always attribute the Manila Water Works project to Carriedo no, because he provided the capital, he provided the funds. But for me, equal recognition should be given to Henaro Palacios because if not, no, If not for his um, or his expertise, his techno scientific expertise, really, no, it was crucial. It was crucial to the concretization, the materialization of the Manila Water Works project in Manila. So, sino si Naro Palacios? He was one of the first civil engineers na dumating sa Manila in 1867. A year after that, in 1868, nabigay sa kanya yung proyekto ng pag-aralan at mag, napag-aralan ang, uh, ang estado ng, ng sistema ng patubigan sa Maynila at magharap ng proposal kung paano ito masusunusyonan as early as 1868. It was already given to him. Pero kita mo rin yung tagal, di ba, ng 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 itinagal ng proyektong ito 1868 but it was only in 1882 that the project was inaugurated so decades din yung itinagal 
Bakit? Dahil sa maraming kadahilan. Ang pangulahe, pangulahe, of course, ay capital. Pangalawa, dahil ang Manila Waterworks Project ay isang, tulad ng binanggit ko kanina sa introduction, napakalaki niyang proyekto in terms of magnitude, in terms of project cost, in terms of period of completion. It was divided into different phases. In fact, the blueprint or the proposal of Enaro Palacios was divided into two. One was the conduction of water and number two was water distribution. Okay. Now, the first plan, this plan, as you can see right now in your screen, the first plan of the water system that was designed by Genaro Palacios in 1869, a year after the project was given to him, was a plan that consisted of a complex system of high Roman aqueducts, no? mga aquedukto. The first plan was um, a plan no? ng mga aquedukto. It was um, an aqueduct or um, an aquedukto approximately 27 kilometers in length. Dalawang put pitong kilometro na haba ng mga aquedukto. That was the first plan of Enaro Palacios. From this plan, he proposed that water would be drawn from the San Mateo River where a dam would be constructed in Montalban, which is currently Rodriguez Rical. From this dam in Montalban, water would be conducted to a water reservoir in San Juan del Monte. Aided by gravity, water pipes would be placed in the high and mountainous areas of Montalban and Marikina to direct water from the San Mateo River to San Juan del Monte. However, this original plan of Enaro Palacios was disapproved due to two principal factors. First, the engineers who examined the proposal worried about the structural integrity of the Roman aqueduct system. Imagine, as I've mentioned before, 27 kilometers yung haba ng Roman aqueducts from San uh, from the Montalban uh, areas, yung mountainous areas of Montalban, hanggang sa area ng San Juan del Monte to the water reservoir, 27 kilometers. Now, taking into consideration the frequency of calamities such as earthquakes and typhoons, yung mga engineers na nag-review um, nag, uh, uh, nag ng proposal na ito, they feared na Pag tumama ang isang malakas na um, terremoto or ng isang malakas na earthquake, masisira itong aquedukto na ito. And second, second uh, factor why this proposal was disapproved, the uh, construction of these structures amounted to 12,250,000 pesetas. It was just a huge amount for the capital and for the colony in general. So dalawa, dalawang dahilan, yung design at pangalawa, yung um, budget. Yun yung reasons bakit hindi ito na patupad. So makikita natin dito, ito yung Roman aqueduct, 27 kilometers length na Roman aqueduct hanggang sa makarating sa area ng uh, water reservoir, hanggang sa makarating sa area ng the Arabales of Manila. So, what was the approved plan then? Okay. Palacios, Genaro Palacios, Engineer Palacios, presented a less expensive alternative plan. And this is the plan that you are seeing right now. No? It consisted of drawing water from one of the lower parts of San Mateo River, which is present-day Marikina River, particularly in the area of Libis, no? to a pipeline leading to a water reservoir in San Juan del Monte. Then to the water distribution lines in Manila and its suburbs. This alternative plan became the final blueprint for the Manila water supply system, although it was only on April 30, 1874, that Henaro Palacios submitted the specific details of the plan. This plan went through examinations and reviews by the Manila-based 
Junta de Consultativa de Obras Públicas or the Parashang Public Works Cons Consultative Board. No? On October 19, 1871, the plan went through evaluation and assessment of the Madrid-based Junta Consultativa de Caminos, Puertos y Canales. So this was the consultative board of engineers in Madrid already. So dalawa yung pinagdaanan niya. In the Philippines first, in the colony first, and then it was submitted to Madrid for review and um, approval. No? It was in a royal order approved on June 10, 1875 that the water works plan was approved with some modifications. This less economical second design, which used pumping machines to conduct water, amounted to 3,685,296 pesetas. The proposal was the one supported and approved by the colonial authorities both in the Philippines and in Spain. The budget was divided into two. The first phase was the conduction phase, which um, with a budget of 1,842,264 pesetas. And the second phase of the project was the distribution phase, which reached 1,843,031 pesetas. Appropriating funds for this large scale hydraulic infrastructure involved countless documentations and debates among colonial officials in the Philippines and in Spain. As previously mentioned, the principal source of um, principal source of the project was the Carriedo funds, no, that had grown significantly for the past century. From ten thousand escudos, it grew to one hundred seventy-seven thousand pesetas by the eighteen sixties. So, ganon kalaki yung interest na kinita ng ten thousand capital ng Carriedo. However, kulang pa rin, no? It was not sufficient, no? So other resources had to be tapped to cover the entire costs of the project. As a response, the city council proposed the imposition of a meat tax, no? Impuesto de, de carne. So ano siya, lahat ng karne na bibilhin sa Maynila ay merong added tax. No, at yung added tax na yon ay may, may, may bibigay o may ilalagay doon sa waterworks project. No? This proposal was then approved in Manila and in Spain. No? So, the first phase of conducting water, dito tayo, um, focus tayo sa part na ito ng plan. This part of the plan um, reflects the first phase of conducting water. It began in the San Mateo River, itong area ng San Mateo River, no? Kasi sa pag-aaral ni Hinaro Palacios, itong area na ito, yung may pinaka um, maayos na kalidad ng tubig. Kasi kailangan maging practical eh. Kung pristine, pristine, pristine na water talaga yung kukunin, doon pa sa mas mataas na area ng Muntalban. Pero kailangang paliitin, paigsiin yung um, yung magiging haba no nung nung uh, pipes. So yung area na ito ng San Mateo River yung nakitang um, alternative source. Now, in this part, we will discuss four things, no? How was the water source identified and examined? Number 2, how was water pumped and conducted? Number 3, how was water stored? And lastly, how was water distributed? Simulan natin sa identification ng water source at kung paano ito inexamine. This one. This uh, image, uh, although medyo parang malabo, ang gusto ko lang ipakita ninyo, sa, sa inyo dito ay ma-appreciate sa inyo kung gaano kahaba yung pinagdaanan ng proseso ng pag-aaral para ma-identify saan nga bang anong water source ang pinaka-okay na mapagkuhanan no, ng, ng tubig para sa syudad. What Palacios did was he compared the different water sources, the, I'm sorry, he compared the, the, the quality, the water quality of the different water sources in the different cities of the world. Halimbawa, he identified the different cities in Paris, in the different cities of um, Spain, 
even in New York, no? So iba't ibang mga siyudad. At pagkatapos nito, yung water quality nito, ito, residuals and and grano, no? Yung uh, water residue, no, in in grams per liter. Ito yung nakita. Tapos yung pinakadulo in this table, yung different water sources in Manila, halimbawa, Rio de San Mateo in Marikina, no? The San Mateo River in Marikina or Rio de San Mateo in Santolan. So katulad ng binigit ko kanina, mahaba yung river na yan. So ang ginagawa ng mga engineers, they spe- ni-specify nila which particular areas of the river yung pinagkuhanan nila ng tubig. So mayroong area ng Marikina, may area ng Santolan. Rio de San Mateo in Tungtung, sa area ng Tungtung, or Pasig River. Now, what's interesting dito sa... Um, dito sa ginawa ni Naro Palacios was he employed also yung developing technologies in chemistry and science you know, kung paano pwedeng ma-ensure na maganda yung kalidad ng tubig na mapapadala sa syudad. So, ang ginawa ko, I translated the, the different documents. Um, ito yung summary findings. No? Nagbigay, naglagay ng mga water samples Dinagay, binigay ito sa mga iba't ibang mga farmacia, mga pharmacies kasi sila lang yung at that time in the 19th century sila lang yung may lisensya para magsuri ng mga ganit ng ng, ng mga ganitong um, ng mga ganitong sample at itong mga pharmacy na ito ito yung pinakita nilang findings at sang ayon kay Hinaro Palatios at sa mga uh, experts sa mga chemists no ito yung um ito yung um, summary ng findings no um, halimbawa yung tubig from the area now of Makati ng Pasig River napakadami no ng water sorry ng water residue no uh, na naiiwan sa tubig meron itong lime carbonate indications of magnesia large quantity of organic substances no The water can be considered as potable considering the number of salts but it contains a large amount of organic matter. Therefore, water can only be used for drinking if it goes through the process of filtering uh, of, of filtration no, through layers of carbon. So ito yung, di ba, nabanggit ko kanina, ito na yung pinakamahal na tubig na nabibili sa Maynila mula yung binibenta ng mga water carriers or mga aguadores. Pero gamit ang chemical analysis, hindi pa rin pala siya um, masyadong okay kasi may mala, mal, masyadong malaking content ng organic matter. No? Now, comparing this to the river of San Mateo, itong tatlong ito, tapos yung different areas, pareho na aside from yung tungtong itong dalawang ito yung San Mateo River in Marikina and Santolan little amount of salts no tapos pinakita yung iba't ibang uh, composition of water uh, in Ma- in Marikina the water contains some organic matter also in Santolan it also contains organic matter no mayroon ding mga organic matter pero hindi kasing lala noong water from the Pasig River in Makati Okay. So um given this uh data, no? Although the previous chemical analysis of the San Mateo River supported its good water quality, the consultative board of engineers in Manila and in Madrid made adjustments to the plan made by Palacios by including filtration galleries in Santolan to ensure that water impurities and turbidity would not be drawn from the said river no so yan yung naging um, solution maglagay ng mga filtration techniques in santolan balik tayo dito so this is the river ang ginawa so water will be conducted from the river ito na yung identify and then they they um built no a water pumping station in Santolan here in this area water from San Mateo River was pumped by steam powered engines located in Santolan so this is Santolan this is this area okay 
these machines or the steam powered machines in Santolan pumped 103 liters of water 103 liters of water per second for the daily consumption of 220,000 inhabitants according to the plan the pumping station would use Cornish machines an English technology developed in the 19th century that used coal to generate high pressure vessels that would elevate and draw off water. Para makita, para makita lamang ninyo, so that I, I'll, I'll show you, this is the, the design of the steam-powered uh, water pump. What, the water pumps that were installed in Santolan. So yun. So hinigop ng pump na ito, ng steam-powered pumps na ito, yung tubig from the San Mateo River dito sa Santolan. Okay. Now, pagdating sa Santolan dito, okay, from this pumping station in Santolan, anong nangyari? Water was drawn by a 5 kilometer, ito yun, this, this, this canal, okay, water was drawn by a 5 kilometer cast iron pipe, no? towards El Deposito. This is the El Deposito. Now, yung uh, area kung saan itong Museo El Deposito, no, in San Juan del Monte. This is the El Deposito or the water reservoir. No? Deposito in Espanol, deposit, parang Filipino din, deposito, di ba? Imbakan ng tubig no? in San Juan del Monte. An underground reservoir here in San Juan del Monte and El Deposito was designed by Genaro Palacios. The underground, oh, sorry, the underground water reservoir had a total capacity of 56,000 cubic meters of water daily. According to Hinaro Palacios, he chose San Juan del Monte as the location of the water reservoir because of its unique location and its sufficient elevation, which was necessary to be able to pump and supply water to the capital. Kasi maganda nga naman yung location ng El Deposito, no, ng San Juan del Monte. Para siyang nasa ano siya eh, siya yung magandang location na from Santolan uh, Pumping Station to the Arabales. Kung baga nasa gitna siya. Tapos ang kagandahan kasi ng San Juan del Monte, it's in a hill. Nasa isang loma siya, loma. It's an elevated land. So from that elevated area, mas madali yung pag-distribute ng water papunta sa capital. Okay? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, napakita ko na to. Ito lang yung, um, I wanted to show this to you. Um, para lang mapakita na noong pinaplano yung uh, waterworks na ito, ang daming different technologies, hindi lang span. In fact, ang isa sa mga kailangan nating natin ma-appreciate, yung waterworks project was a, a, a project, a product of the different technologies. no? Different technologies. French technology, British technology, Spanish technology, Filipino technology, produkto ito ng iba't ibang mga teknolohiya at iba't ibang conocimiento or knowledge no? nung panahong ito. So halimbawa, meron kang mga machines from Belgium, from France, from France, no? from France. So iba't ibang mga um, manufacturers, iba't ibang mga machines, iba't ibang mga teknolohiya ang ginamit para sa proyektong ito. Kaya very interesting siya as as a project, no? Isa siyang kung pagtitingnan natin yung history of engineering kumbaga in Manila, ang gandang pag-aralan ng waterworks project kasi ano siya, very rich, no? Yung involvement ng iba't ibang klase ng mga tao at mga um, actors, no? Kung paano na concretize itong project na ito. Okay. Now, from the El Deposito, sorry. This is the picture of uh, the building of the water reservoir. From the El Deposito or from the water reservoir, water was forcefully conducted to a line of cast iron pi pipes of varied measurements and diameters along a purchased right of way to the city. Aqueducts, bridges, and overpass had to be constructed so that pipelines could cross from the various rivers, 
streams, and esteros from the San Mateo River to the distribution pipes towards the capital. Hinaro Palacios and the other engineers designed many plans, such as those that were constructed in the San Juan del Monte River, as well in the streams of El Metaño, Ulat, Sugnason, Payatas, Bocana, Nokban, etc. So ang dami kasing mga streams, maraming mga um, creek, no? sa pagitan ng San Mateo River pa hanggang sa Maynila. So ang daming tinayo ng mga akwedukto at mga tulay para dito. And ang magandang example niyan ay ito. No? Ito yung plan for the San Juan del Monte aqueduct, aqueducto. No? Ito yung plan. And then this was, uh, ito yung aqueducto sa San Juan del Monte at makikita natin yung pipes. No? Ng uh, water pipes. No? At yung... Um, women no in in the river no so talagang produkto talaga ito ng maraming technological uh, and engineering kumaga technological and engineering um talag project talaga ito no na ang daming kinailangan gawin no para ma ma, ma conduct ang water papunta sa sa Maynila and also, very specific yung plans ni Naro Palacios, no? What they did was, they identified the different streets in Manila. And sa bawat street na yun, pinag-aralan nila ano yung laki ng water pipe na kailangang uma, um, ilagay sa particular streets na yan. Different sizes of pipelines no, were uh, employed. Halimbawa, there were pipes. And na ang diameter ay 65 meters at yung pinakamaliit ay 8 meters in diameter. And very scientific also ang plano ni Hinaro Palacios because he, they, they had to identify the total length in meters that constituted the waterwork system. Halimbawa, ilang metro ba ng 65 meter pipeline yung kailangan para sa entire waterworks project. No? So halimbawa, 1,175 I'm sorry, 1,170 meters of 65 meter pipeline yung kailangan, no? et cetera. So, in total, kinailangan ng 25,925 meters no? na, na pipes yung kinailangan sa plano. Pero in the end, nadagdagan pa ito kasi naglagay ng mga um, additional pipes sa iba't ibang mga uh, shorter streets uh, or smaller streets in the in the capital. So, para maki ma ma, -ident ma mapakita ko lang sa yon sa inyo. Sorry, um, siguro yung magandang picture is this one. This one. Okay. So, ulitin ko lang. Water was uh, the 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 source of water was the Marikina. I'm sorry, the San Mateo River. Okay. They put the, uh, 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 a pumping station here in Santolan and a five, five kilometer cast iron pipe conducted water to the water reservoir, which stored water no, for the daily consumption of Manila's inhabitants. From the El Deposito or from the water reservoir in San Juan del Monte, water was then carried to first in the area of Sampaloc. Sampaloc, the suburb of Sampaloc, from the er, suburb of Sampaloc, dito nang mula yung mga principal water distribution lines, the bigger pipelines. So yung Sampaloc um, distribution line, bumaba yan to the different suburbs here in, sorry, Sampaloc, here in the area of San Miguel, Quiapo, Santa Cruz, Binondo, and Tundo. Now, syempre, kailangan mag-cross yung pipeline papunta sa left bank of Pasig River kasi syempre nandoon yung Intramuros. So ang ginawa ay pinatawid no yung pipeline na ito para marating ang Intramuros and then from Intramuros marating yung areas of Ermita and Malate and Paco. So that's the that's a distribution line. Now if you have questions mamaya na lang um, sa discussion. Okay. Sige. Palacios, in his plan, attempted to create a system of water distribution in Manila and its suburbs through the identification and classification of streets from which he would base the type of pipelines 
pipelines that would traverse the different sort of fares of the suburbs. The increasing legibility of Manila in the last quarter of the 19th century definitely aided the waterworks projects as street names and street designations became important indicators and markers of the city's condition. Through this technique, the engineers were able to identify the spaces where pipelines were to be placed. For instance, in Binondo, the distribution lines, ito yung Binondo, the distribution lines were identified in the following manner. Babasahin ko. It was in uh, in Spanish yung original uh, lines, pero para lang ma-imagine niyo paano nila paano nila plinano sa ang mga streets magkakaroon ng pipelines, no? Binondo, this is uh, words of Palacios, ha? Binondo has large spaces that demand various distribution lines that we'll, we will point out. One line by the street of San, of San Jacinto to the street of Escolta, the other from Tetuan Street to the street of San Jacinto, another from the front door of the door of the Binondo Church in Nueva Street leading to the dock of San Gabriel, which is linked to the line of Escolta Street. Another line... Uh, towards Holo Street in the plaza, another line from the foot of the bridge to the dock of the new customs office that is under construction, another pipeline from the Divisoria to the Masic Tobacco Factory, and lastly from the street of Santo Cristo on the side of the Divisoria Market to the foot of the Holo Bridge. So ang gusto ko lang ma-appreciate ninyo or ma-imagine ninyo dito is that they had to identify, no, nakatulong o oh, kinailangan na mayroong street names, may mga pangalan ng mga kali, at malino yung legible yung syudad, kumbaga, para ma-identify nila, ito yung pipeline. Dapat ganito yung, yung flow ng pipeline. Dapat dito iikot yung pipe. Sa kaling ito, dahil importante ito, dahil may factory ng tabako dito, dapat lagyan dito ng pipe. Dito kasi malapit ito sa simbahan, dapat may water pipeline dito. So yung ganun, di ba? mahaba yung pagkakano na kinailangan para ma-identify itong mga areas na ito. Um, one can infer that Palacios prioritized the spaces where people typically converged in identifying the places no, where distribution lines were, be, were replaced. So, ha, saan ito? This included the foot of the bridges, no, malapit sa mga tulay, major docks, mga um, docks, mga um, daungan, no? churches, plazas, markets, and industries. No? Halimbawa ng tobacco factory. So yan yung mga pangunahing consideration. Naturally, the technical team also considered the number of inhabitants as determinant whether distribution lines should pass through a particular street. No? So yan yung mga naging considerations nila. Okay. Now, ang ginawa ko uh, dun sa aking dissertation was gusto ko kasing malaman, okay, may nag, mayroon ng mga pipelines in Manila. Pero ang gusto kong malaman, gaano o ano yung kondisyon ng water access at water distribution vis-a-vis -vis the population of the different suburbs in Manila. So what I did was, using the different plans, medyo matrabaho, Using the different plans of Inaro Palacios, inisa-isa ko saan naglagay ng mga water fountains, ng mga public fountains sa different arabales. Halimbawa, what I did, these dots or circles, shaded circles, represent the different fountains that were put in place no? nakabilang sa Manila Waterworks. So, halimbawa, the dots in blue ito yung mga fountains, water fountains, na may isang faucet, may isang um, lagusan ng tubig. Whereas itong mga dots na ito na in pink, ito yung mga water fountains na may dalawang lagusan ng tubig. So mayroong dalawang taong pwedeng magkasabay na kumuha ng tubig. Or mayroong mga fountains na mayroong apat. So apat na magkakasabay na pwedeng kumuha ng tubig. So yan yung ginawa ko, nilagay ko, plinat ko siya doon sa mapa para lang magkaroon tayo ng idea na sa ang mga lugar ba yung may mga water fountains, anong mga kaliang may water fountains at gaano kadami yung mga tao dito. So para mas ma-appreciate natin yung plan na ito, ito siya. So this is the Pasig River, again, 
So we have Intramuros, Paco, Ermita, Malate. On the left bank of Pasig, we have Binondo, Tondo, Santa Cruz, Quiapo, San Miguel, San Palo, on the right bank of the river. Now, using the population data at that time, ang ginawa ko was to represent yung uh, population per Arabal. So halimbawa, Binondo, Tondo, and Santa Cruz, ito yung mga areas na may malaking population. Nag umiikot sa 37,000 to 57,000 na katao or 17,000 to 37,000 katao. So makikita niyo the, the bigger the orange circle is, ibig sabihin, ito yung areas, ito yung Arabales na eh, densely populated. So makikita natin yan, Binondo, Tondo, Santa Cruz. Whereas yung mga mal malati as well, may yung maliliit, Quiapo, Paco, Quiapo, uh, sorry, Quiapo, Paco, San Miguel. Kasi yung Intramuros medyo ano siya, um, nasa kalagitnaan siya. Now, ang ginawa ko, um, gusto kong tignan yung ratio, ng ratio ng tao sa water access. So, given yung population data, what I did was, um, this map will show you the ratio of water fountain to the number of inhabitants per suburb. So, halimbawa, makikita natin na ang binondo ay may ratio ng one water faucet to 413 inhabitants. Kung ikukumpara mo yan sa Sampalok na ang isang water faucet ay nagsiservisyo sa 955 residents of Sampaloc or Malate na ang isang water faucet ay magsiservisyo sa 1,071 water residents. So what I want you to appreciate here is that makikita natin ano yung mga areas na mayroong relatively um, better, had better access to water, had better water access at that time at ano yung mga areas na um, were uh, in worse yung kanilang water access. So, tingnan na lamang ninyo yung mga kulay. Yung areas na um, uh, lighter yung shade, ito yung areas na mas relatively mas okay yung kanilang water access. Halimbawa, Santa Cruz, one water faucet to 300 inhabitants. Whereas, the darker you get, yung shade, ibig sabihin yan, mas mahirap yung water access in these areas. Malate, Elmita, Sampalo, Cantundo were the areas that had Poorer, poorer water access, whereas in Tramuros, Binondo, Santa Cruz, sila yung may mas okay. And then Paco, San Miguel, and Quiapo, sila yung nasa gitna. No? So yun yung para ma-appreciate ma, ma, ma natin no? yung water access. Now, what I also did was, um, towards the latter part of the 19th century, sa archives, merong mga makakapal at sobrang daming mga resibo ng tubig. Kasi at first, yung water fountains na inilagay sa, inilagay sa, um, sa Manila was libre. Kapag nasa, pag ang tubig ay magagaling sa public water fountain, libre siya. Walang bayad. But then, in the late 19th century, na-introduce yung concept ng domesticated water. Water was then led to the private homes in Manila. Water then was quantified. Water was um, water was sold. Sorry, wala na akong battery. And um, water was sold and water was domesticated. So ito yung isang example ng um, isang resibo noong 19th century. Makikita ninyo dito yung resibo. Ito yung klase ng resibo ng tubig. Halimbawa, from the uh, yung Tambiento de Manila, mes de Oktubre, uh, Desyembre, from October to December 1897. Ito, suministro de agua or uh, water supply, Don Abraham Garcia. So si Abraham Garcia yung kliyente. Nagbay, nakatira siya sa Plaza Cervantes del Distrito de Binondo. So taga Binondo siya. Okay, ang kanyang kinonsumo na tubig ay 157 cubic meters ang consumption niya ng tubig sa loob ng 92 days. So in three months, he consumed 157 cubic meters of water na um, daily meron siyang consumption ng 1.715 cubic meter daily yung consumption niya. So 
ito yung kanyang kailangang bayaran, kinailangan niyang magbayad ng 6 pesos and 31 centavos for the three months na nagkonsumo siya ng 157 cubic meters of water. So marami ito, maraming mga resibo ng tubig ito. So ang ginawa ko kasi, gusto kong malaman ano yung mga areas na merong, ano yung area sa Manila na unang nagkaroon ng private water supply o mga kabahayan sa Manila na unang naservisyohan ng tubig sa bahay. So what I did was using these resibos, ah, isa pang example ng resibo, ito naman si Mariano Lim Chap, taga San Miguel naman siya, kumonsumo siya ng um, uh, nasa 19, 20 plus cubic meters, he had to pay 30 pesos and 74 cents sa loob ng uh, Ah, sa kanyang konsumo na, I'm sorry, 815 cubic meters ang kanyang kinonsumo mula July, August to September of 1897. So he paid 30 pesos and 70 cents. So using this receipts, ang ginawa ko was, gusto ko kasi makita ano yung, ano yung mga lugar sa Maynila, ano yung mga arabalas na merong households na may direct water access through water pipes. So makikita natin ang ang mga arabales or suburbs na merong mas maraming kabahayan na meron ng uh, direktang access sa tubig ay ang ito. Binondo, Quiapo, Intramuros, Ermita, Santa Cruz, samantalang yung mga mahihirap na mga arabales or suburbs ng Troso, Dilaw, Sampalok, Malate at Tondo, ito naman yung mga kakaunti lang yung mga bahay na mayroong kakayahan na magbayad ng tubig na nakarating sa loob ng mga bahay nila. So in a way, makikita natin dito sa data na ito, ano yung areas ng Manila, yung socioeconomic status no, ng suburbs ng Manila, batay sa access ng tubig. Na alarming kasi kung tutuusin mo yung mga lugar na maraming tao, ito yung kaunti lang yung uh, uh, public water fountains at ito lang din yung mga bahay na kaunti lang yung may water access like Tondo, like Sampalok. Kasi ito yung mga lugar kung saan nakatira ang mas maraming um, natives at mas maraming mga lower class Indios in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, compared to the burgeoning areas, the, so, the economic centers of Binondo, Quiapo, Santa Cruz, na merong mga commercial establishments, and of course, Intramuros. Okay? Yan. Sige. This is the last slide. Showing the final network of pipes for the city's waterworks. After the end of the Spanish rule in the Philippines, water fountains were available for free in the different public spaces in Manila. In 1904, um, American officials wrote, no, na yung na ilagay na water, Manila waterworks system ng mga Espanyol ay mayroong ay nakapag-provide ng, ng tubig sa mga maraming residente. However, they said, no, na by 1904, malapit ng ma-breach, malapit ng ma-reach yung full capacity nito. Kasi sobrang bilis ng pagdami ng tao sa Manila. Remember, the Waterworks Project was designed for a city na mayroong nasa 220,000, close to 250,000 residents. Pagdating ng late 19th century, Manila's population exploded to 300,000. At pataas ng pataas ng pataas ng pataas ang populasyon nito. So, um, isa yan sa mga nakitang limitations na pagdating ng 20th century, no? yung impeding scarcity ng water. However, the Manila Water Work System as a public works project definitely symbolized the triumph of engineering in the last decades of Spanish rule in the Philippines. 
It represented an optimistic view of how technological solutions could be devised to respond to the public health and sanitation problems of the colony. The creation of institutions dedicated to the construction of public works projects, the presence of engineers with a broader technological know-how, the open participation of different players in the field of science and technology, the evident political will of the municipal authorities of Manila and the central colonial government, and the changing attitudes towards sanitation, public health, and urban space in a rapidly urbanizing city were all vital factors for the realization of one of the biggest sanitary infrastructure projects in Manila. Indeed, providing safe and clean water was the colonial government's direct response to the cholera epidemics in the 19th century and the growing pressure of providing a basic service to a growing colonial capital. However, it should also be mentioned that the waterworks inaugurated in 1882 did not directly mean the eradication of waterborne illnesses and diseases. This study, uh, this presentation, halimbawa, dun sa latter part of the presentation, exposes that the laying, laying out of the waterworks system did not guarantee equal access and full distribution of clean, safe, and affordable water for the entire inhabitants of the city. In Manila, while it is important to recognize the construction of a revolutionizing public work, which was the Waterworks Project, it is also equally important to ask, what was the reach of the water supply in Manila? Who had access to it? These questions, once answered, would paint a picture, such in the case of Manila, of an incomplete modernity, because there were also citizens who, would lay, who laid claim to potable water, and there were residents who were left to make do as best as they could. So, yun yung naging uh, case ng Manila. Certainly, no, the, pres uh, the Waterworks Project uh, in Manila presents a very complex intersection between technological innovations and the many layers of the politics of sanitation and water access in the colonial context. As with other goods and urban services, the circulation of water and its mechanisms of access and as well as exclusion reveal relations of economic and political power. So maraming salamat po. Ayan. Maraming salamat, Dr. Ross Costello, para sa inyong napakamakabuluhang pagbabahagi ng knowledge tungkol dito sa Patubigan Karyedo. Ngayon po, um, dadako na po tayo sa mga ilang katanungan na nakalap natin sa ating Facebook Live. Uh, tanong, unang tanong mula kay Kim Jr. Magandang hapon po. Meron pa rin po bang... Uh, Naiwan na relics na ang Cariedo water system sa kasalukuyan. Halimbawa nito yung mga water pipes. At ano pong nangyari sa El Deposito sa noong panahon ng kontemporaryo bago ito naging pinaglabanan shrine? Masyadong maabang po yung tatumahan pero ano pong... Ah. Baka nga dapat ma'am kayo yung sasagot kayo kasi po yung <laughs> kayo mapalad tayo dahil kayo yung um uh, ayun doon sa tayo right, sa Kim uh, uh, na ano nga bang nangyari sa ano sa El Deposito nitong mga ka, ano matapos na hindi na siya tuluyang nagamit nung ano eh nung panahon ng pagpasok ng Amerikano at um uh, Japanese period dahil nagamit na sa iba't ibang purpose yung mismong El Deposito. Ah uh, naging ano parang naging imbakan ng mga armas, naging ospital, ganun. Pero ma'am ang tanong ko na may connection din dito sa tanong ni Kim. Um uh, anong taon ma'am yung tuluyan ng hindi nagamit yung El Deposito bilang primary source ng Maynila ay uh, primary source ng tubig sa Kamaynilaan. Anong exact year siya ma'am? Hindi ako makapagbigay ng specific year. Siguro yung isang um, limitation din ng study ko 
is that yung focus ko talaga ay until the late uh, until the late 19th century and basta yung Spanish colonial rule. Although I was able to research doon sa early years of the American period, pero mm-hmm. I need no I need to consult more primary sources. But um tulad nung last na bahagi ko dun sa presentation, um well for one the Americans the Americans continued no continued um uh, using the um the Manila Water Works system placed no by this the Spaniolis. Kaya yung mm-hmm. ito yung isa sa mga like kong sinasabi dito sa study ko doon sa public works projects na madalas meron tayong meron tayong ganitong or meron tayong paniwala, yung asing traditional na ng paniwala na una ang ang mga maraming infrastructures na ganito ay nangyari lamang sa panahon ng 20th century, karamihan panahon ng mga Amerikano, hindi siya completely true. Kasi second half of the 19th century, marami na tayong makikita mga revolutionary public works projects. Mm-hmm. At marami dito ay ipinagpatuloy na lamang pagdating ng 20th century. So ito yung gusto kong ma-appreciate natin na these projects went beyond the traditional raptures of uh, yung colonial raptures no yung halimbawa ang ang pag-iisip kasi natin wala yan sa panahon ng Espanyol dumating lang yan sa panahon ng mga Amerikano pero gusto, gusto kong ma- maintindihan natin yung continuities no nagpatuloy yung mga maraming proyekto at in fact yung blueprint ng Manila Water Works ay pinagpatuloy ng mga Amerikano pero inexpand nila yan Mm-hmm. Kasi kinailangan nilang solusyonan yung growing scarcity kasi nga Nang grabe tindi. yung paglaki ng populasyon ng Maynila in the first decades ng 20th century. So ang na-identify nila was yung paglalagay na pag-create ng dams. Mm-hmm. Pag-create na ng dams at hindi na lamang yung magiging yung water resource ay yung San Mateo River. Kung hindi yung dam... Uh, yung dam na, na ang magsisilbing ano... Uh, exacto. Exacto. So, um, magandang tanong yan um, kung anong year specifically. Kasi kung... Actually, for me nga, mahirap ma- ma-identify. Kasi ano pag-ibig sabihin natin ng specific year? Kasi kung titignan mo yung pipelines pinagpatuloy yan hindi naman nila tinanggal yung pipelines eh hindi mm. nila hindi nila tinanggal pinagpatuloy so yung siguro yung tanong ay yung water reservoir maybe yung El Deposito mm-hmm. kasi yung El Deposito ay naging highly contentious space siya kasi pinag-agawan siya di ba during okay. the revolution uh, yung isang yung meron tayong NHC period researcher si Paolo Calamlam he did, he did a very good paper on this kung paano naging contentious space yung water reservoir yung El Deposito for the Katipuneros for the Filipino revolutionaries for the Spanish for the Americans and Spanish because who, who controlled water at that time sa panahon ng revolusyon controlled I mean had power di ba so um. pinag pinagagawa nila yung area na yan So siguro yung tanong ay yung water reservoir per se kung kailan siya huling ginamit as a water reservoir pero the pipelines um continued yung paggamit dito. Mm, thank you ma'am. So nang nabanggit niyo ma'am yung Ayo uh, sorry may isa pala pala. Yung kung meron bang nag uh, na, 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 nagpatuloy na mga water hydrants meron di ba? Um kaya pwede siguro kunin natin yung chance na ito na imbitahan sila kung, kung pwede nang pumunta sa Museo Deposito kasi di pa mayroong ilang naka-exhibit na uh, public hi- na water hydrants. Na Apo, meron hydrants. itong original oh, pang water hydrant na ano, parang ito na yata yung last na dating located sa Paco, sa Paco Cemetery. Sa Paco Cemetery. Yes, so, yes. Mm-hmm. Pero ma'am, uh, may I also ask, yung di ba meron tayong water hydrant and the uh, fire hydrant. Uh, fire hydrant and the fountain. Um, Magkaiba ba sila ng ano ng ng purpose saka ano yung mas maraming nag uh, uh, establish yung mga fire hydrants or yung fountain mismo okay Mag- magandang tanong uh, po yan na hindi ko na pasadahan dito sa presentation ko noong nag naglagay sila nag distribute yung iba't ibang mga uh, water fountains public water fountains in the different arabales ang isa kasi sa kinailangan din nilang solusyonan was not was not only yung potable source of water for the residents but also yung ang tawag dito ay mga bocas de riego edientiendo mga incendio mga ano ito mga um, 
ito yung hydrant na gagamitin para dinisi ng mga kali. Na-imagine mm. yung mga yan na merong ilalagay na hose. Mm. Oo, mm. ilalagay sila ng hose na manggerang tawag. Tapos, panglilinis sa mga kali. Kasi, um, at that time, concern yung public hygiene. Sanitation. Mm. Diba? Mm. So, lalong-lalo na kapag uh, madumi na yung mga kali, gagamitin siyang panglinis sa mga kali. At, Pangalawang mahalagang problema, malaking problema din sa Maynila at that time, ay yung laging pagkakaroon ng mga sunog. Mm-hmm. So, yan talaga yung so kasabayan, ng pag, kasabayan ng pag-install pag, 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 uh, ng waterworks uh, system in Manila ay yung pagsasaayos din ng kwerpo de bombero sa Manila. Kasi... Kasi kapag sa panahon ng 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 insendyo ng ng fire, ginagamit yung mga bokas na ito. Usually yung mga public uh, hydrants na ito, water hydrants na ito, meron siyang uh, merong uh, uh, sorry, merong area kung saan uh, aagos yung inuming tubig at yung may area naman kung saan aagos yung tubig para sa Uh, incendio para sa fires at sa uh-uh. mas marami siyempre yung para sa inuming tubig mm-hmm. so then ma'am yung um, yung location ng no mismong Cariedo Fountain isa lang po ba talaga ang Cariedo Fountain or meron pang other fountain na yun o uh, yung mismong Cariedo Fountain sa Sampaloc di ba ma'am yung original location niya Doon yung mismong big event ng inauguration. Pero meron pa rin bang iba pang parang sub-fountains? Parang ganun? Eh, meron, lang, meron kasi isa lang na, meron isang na-publish na para siyang, um, para siyang, memor, parang siyang naging memorabilia noong nag, yung inauguration ng water mm-hmm. fountain. At least sa source na yan, yung symbolic fountain really was the Carieda Fountain na nilagay nila sa rotonda ng Sampalo. Mm-hmm. Yun yung yun yung symbolic fountain na very artistic yung pagkakagawa, di ba? Mm, yung yung nang, may nang ano, yung may parang tore. Yes. Ah, pero kung pero kung ang tanong ay kung merong iba pang mga fountains na uh, nilagay in honor. Ito mm-hmm. yung naging babanggit eh. Wala pa akong nakita na document, archival document na um na parang kasing uh, nakatulad no nung Carriedo Fountain na nilagay nila sa Sampalo. Yung the rest ay mas simple mga simple na, na mga water hydrants. Ah, Thank you ma'am. Ayan. Ang tanong ni John Paul, ayan. Pero na-discuss niyo na rin to kanina ma'am. Maliban sa Intramuros, saan pa po ba may mga pipe water system noong Spanish colonial period? Actually, hindi lang siya sa Intramuros, no? Um, yun nga yung pinakita ko dun sa latter part ng presentation na um, ang madalas kasi di ba na pagtingin o yung very traditional na pagtingin, Intramuros lang lagi yung meron o mga ganitong mm-hmm. sip. Kasi andun yung ano eh. Yung oh, that's, that's a misconception. Uh-huh. That's a misconception na kailangan natin i-correct. Pagdating ng 19th century, in fact, mas maraming mga Espanyol ang nakatira na sa labas ng Intramuros. Mm. Problema, oh, oh, problema na nga ng colonial government, yung, uh, o maraming mga dokumento ang nagsasabi na walang, wala nang gustong tumira sa loob ng Intramuros. True. Kaya mayroong problema ng mga um, na ino-occupy ng mga taong walang bahay yung mga areas ng Intramuros or di kaya may problems ng sanitation kasi abandoned yung houses sa Intramuros. Kasi lahat sila, merong, or karamihan sa mga Spanyoles, meron silang second residence sa outside, outside of Intramuros. Especially in, in Benondo, in Santa Cruz, yung areas kung saan nandun yung commercial activity, yung vibrant commercial activity in Manila in the 19th mm-hmm. century. Wala sa loob ng Intramuros kung hindi sa labas. Kaya kung mapapansin mo nga um, yung uh, yung water yung pipelines mas marami pa nga ang pipelines na um na, na nag-traverse sa different streets ng Binondo at ng Santa Cruz kaysa sa Intramuros. Oh, nakita ko dun sa map kanina. Pansinin oh. ni sa map kasi mm-hmm. nandun yung 
Ito yung commercial center, yung political and religious center in Tramuros, yes, pero the commercial in center was that area of Binondo, Santa Cruz, Quiapo. Nandun, yung, nandun ang mga tao, dun sila gumagalaw. So, kaya mm-hmm. dito nagkaroon ng mas malaki, mas maraming pipelines. Apo. For ano, the last, uh, ano ma'am, di ba parang may sin- nabanggit kayo na parang may social class na nagaganap sa access ng ano ng, ng water. Although, na- nasabi niyo kanina na pag ano kapag uh, sa karaniwang streets free ang ano free ang tubig di ba po free ang access ng tubig pero meron na rin nag-start ay uh, what year yun ma'am yung nagkaroon na ng simula na pwede na yung kanya-kanyang mga private homes na ang magkaroon ng sariling Tuba, access into uh, clean water, water. From oo, 1882 na inaugurate. Ala, ah, ito pala, nakalimutan kong banggitin. Siguro isang isang patunay na talagang major feat itong uh, Manila Water Works Project. Kasi 1882 to na inaugurate. Inaugurate, mm-hmm. sorry. Isa ito sa pinakaunang uh, complex water works system in the Asian region. Ang Singapore, they opened their system, Manila, uh, sorry, their... Waterwork system in 1878, tayo 1882. So halos magkasabayan ang Singapore at ang Manila ang may unang piped water uh, water service in in Asia. In Asia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So ano ang ang Madrid nagkaroon sila ng piped water system 1850s, 1858, 1860s. So dalawang dekada ang nahuli ang ang Manila. So ano yung gusto kong iparating? Talagang ano siya, no? Um, importante siyang uh, public works project at isang urban service na talagang ahead, kumbaga nangunguna no? sa time na yon mm-hmm. So mahalagang banggitin yon Yung sinasabi mong, um, sorry nga, nawala, nawala na ako. An- ano nga po yung ulit? <laughs> yung social class ma'am ah, sa pag social... access ng clean water. <laughs> yes. Ano siya, actually mas, it more than social, it's, yung economic no yung yung socio economic um uh, factor no doon sa pag acquire doon sa pagkakaroon ng access ng tubig uh, pinakita ko sa inyo kanina na yung mas mayayamang mga suburbs ng Binondo, Santa Cruz, Quiapo ito rin yung mga unang mga suburbs in Manila na nagkaroon ng mga private water access yung mga kabahayan. Sila yung mga, nung tinitignan ko yung mga resibo ng mga tao na nagbayad ng, uh, ng tubig, no? ng, ng kanilang paggamit ng tubig, ito yung mga resid, uh, tao na nakatira sa mga mayayamang arabales or suburbs of Pinondo, Santa Cruz, Quiapo, and of also in Intramuros. Tapos yung mga areas kung saan majority ang nakatira ay mga uh, lower class Filipinos or natives, lalong-lalo na ang area ng Tundo, ang area ng Sampaloc. Ito yung bihirang-bihira lamang yung mga private households na nagbayad ng uh, tubig, mm-hmm. ng uh, private water uh, access sa tubig. Pero ma'am, kung ikukumpara yung halaga ng, ng tubig nila before, sa ngayon, magkano kaya nag-radio? Katulad mo yung resibong na pinakita nyo kanina. Di ba interesting yung magkano 6 pesos or 20 pesos for 3 months? Magkano na kaya yung halaga nun ngayon? If, um, Par- yeah, parang ang hirap. Ang hirap. Ang hirap. Ano? Ang hirap. <laughs> Lagi kasi sa akin yung natatanong pag may nagtutour. Kasi di ba, yung halaga ng tubig pag... Uh, Pag sa Pasig River is 2 pesos and 50 centavos isang tinaha. Pag uh, galing sa San Juan uh, streams ay two, uh, 12 pesos and, and 50 cents. So mas mahal. Mas malinis, mas mahal. So, Pero yeah. ano yan, Miss, uh, yan, before yan noong Panela Waterworks, before yan ng, oh, yun, oh, ng before pipe pa. water system. Oh, oh, nung okay. ano yan, kasi kaya... Ano din, dahil yan ay um, biniben, bini, binibili sa mga tinatawag na mga agwador, mga water uh, users, no? Uh, Pero pwede siguro nating tignan kung halimbawa um, eh, doon sa resibo, pwede, ni, pwede nating ma, 
A ver, pwede natin ma makita halimbawa kung um, ito, uh, 37 pesos ang binayad para sa 800 cubic meters. Ah, oo, tama. Sige, so, pwede, pwede so, ninyong ito. Yan. Yung sa cubic meters na meron ang ang it's either Manila or Manila water, kung magkano na siya i-convert? Oo, oh, oh. halimbawa, <laughs> tingnan natin, itong, itong, sige, para lang maano natin yan. Um, halimbawa, um, okay, ito, um, ang binayaran niya ay 30 pesos, 30 pesos, sabi na natin 31 pesos. Tapos, ang kanyang kinonsumo ay uh, 815 cubic meters. Tingnan lang natin. Nasa 0 0.03 or 0 0.04. Parang nasa 0 0.04 cents per cubic meter. Mm. Nasa ganun siya. So, di ko alam kung scientific enough yan, pero para lang Sige. magkaroon tayo ng idea. Ah, yung siguro yung maganda rin banggitin, marami sa mga um, marami, marami sa mga private households na mayroong um, direct water access, ito rin yung mga apelido na halimbawa ang mga paterno. Ah, yung mga kilalang pamilya talaga. Mm -hmm. Kilalang yung mga... Uh, ano na ma'am, yung limhap. Di ba parang kilalang Chinese? <laughs> Paternos, limhaps, the baretos, um... The Tuasons, basically yeah. yung ano din, yung 19th century, uh, late 19th century uh, Filipino mestizos, yung mga mm. middle class, middle class families also na alam nating mga movers ng uh, Philippine economy ng 19th century. Ayan. And this ends our, ano ma'am, our lecture and open forum. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ross Costello. And uh, to close, uh, to officially close this uh, webinar, may I call the Shrine Curator of Museo El Deposito, Mr. Jonel Virabusa. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon to everyone. I hope everyone is safe right now. So as we end this online program in commemoration of the 139th anniversary of the inauguration of the Manila Water Works System, I would like to thank you all, especially to our research speaker, Dr. Ross Costello. Um, thank you very much for sharing to us her research and, uh, and expertise in this topic. Now, the very main purpose of this program is to share the rich history of our water system and at the same time to show how tremendous effort is it, uh, how tremendous effort is needed to provide clean water uh, clean water source to a community especially during that time when they are in the middle of an epidemic so if you will think about it it is somehow similar to what we are experiencing right now so of course we would also like to thank as well the uh, Johnson and Bea Moreno and the National Council for Disability Affairs for aiding us in interpreting our program in sign language especially now that we are observing the National mm -hmm. Disability Prevention and Rehabilitation Week. Uh, of course, we would like to thank our colleagues from the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, uh, the head and the management of the NHGP, our chairman, Chairman Lene Escalante, our chief, Ma'am Gina Batuhan, our supervising HSDO, Mr. Brian Paraiso, and our colleagues from the 27 History Museums of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and we also like to thank, of course, Miss Sara Estubo for assisting us as well from uh, our uh, Laguna Cluster in NHGP for this program. So, muli, uh, maraming maraming salamat po, and we hope that you will continue to support our programs in the upcoming months for this year, especially now that in August we will celebrate the National History Month. Again, uh, we hope everyone is safe, and maraming maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, ma'am.